But the long story short is that he had a month to sit there in prison and think about this before he was actually executed. And this, dial this next dialogue, Crito, occurs during that time. Non ho capito che non stesso se te lo faccio cura. No, Crito. Un uomo non è per colpa delle leggi, ma solo per colpa degli uomini. E se rispondo per ingiustizia con ingiustizia, per male con il male, sono certo che commetterei sacrilegio. So che arrivando al paese dei morti, potrò ripetere questo a mia difesa, e che le leggi del Milano accoglieranno con, con tenerezza. Tutte le parole che ho pronuncio da tanti esempi. Okay, so the first thing, Crito walks in, and Socrates sleeping like a baby, which actually is not a good phrase because babies tend to not sleep very well, which I can say from first-hand experience, but he's sleeping like a rock, maybe we could say, quite peacefully and calmly. Crito says, I have always thought you happy in the calmness of your temperament, but never did I see the like of the easy, cheerful way in which you bear this calamity. Socrates responds, why, Crito, when a man has reached my age, he ought not be repining, meaning recoiling at the thought, at the prospect of death. So Socrates is trying to somewhat humbly just dismiss the compliment as him saying he's not really worthy of it. But Crito rightly responds, and yet other old men find themselves in similar misfortunes, and age does not prevent them from repining. Two very important lessons buried in there. First of all, uh, Crito's right. In the next dialogue we read, Phaedo, we're going to see that Socrates describes philosophy as the preparation for death. A little bit of a morbid way of looking at philosophy, but he has a good reason for saying it, which we'll get to when we talk about that dialogue. But um, the point is, it's something to prepare for something to order one's soul in preparation for, as Socrates would put it. It's not something that the mere passage of time magically prepares us for. Old age does not, does not magically prepare one to approach death well. Um, but also, the lesson here is the fruits of a good philosophy. I think, in a, I think last week we talked about, and I'll say it again just in case we didn't, my, the two shortcuts that exist when you find yourself struggling to figure out some philosophical conundrum. With many conundrums, we can just say, oh, I don't really care, I'm not going to bother trying to figure that out. But with the most important philosophical ones, we can't do that because life itself foists them upon us. And how we live depends upon how we answer these questions. But then you go trying to figure out the answer to them and you find out there's these extremely long-winded, convoluted philosophical debates about them. And those debates are important to engage in. Uh, that's why I'm a philosopher, and that's why I like philosophy. But I understand how very, I mean, that's difficult enough for, for philosophers to do. It's, it's difficult for everybody. And when it seems overwhelming, as I've said before, that's OK, because there's two shortcuts. Follow the fruits. Trust the trustworthy. Forgive me if I'm repeating this, but follow the fruits. Well, what does that mean? Well, just think about science and technology. If a given, if a given scientific theory, whenever it was acted upon, only resulted in inventions that didn't work, you wouldn't think that's a very useful scientific theory, rightfully so, because its fruits are rot, doesn't produce anything good. Well, the fruits of a good philosophy are supposed to be a good life. If someone, has a, if someone is living a good life, and I don't mean has a good life like has money and stuff like that, I mean if someone is choosing to live the good life, and that is obvious in his or her comportment, then odds are that person has a good philosophy. Follow that philosophy, if in doubt. If in doubt, follow the fruits. 
charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, generosity, self-control. Those are fruits of a good philosophy. So there's one shortcut. The second short shortcut is even easier. Trust the trustworthy. You already know trustworthy people, trust them. There's a really easy shortcut. Anyway, I don't recommend that you always take the shortcuts. I encourage you to philosophize. That's why I do what I do. But there's nothing wrong with taking shortcuts. When it's a question you simply must answer in order to know how to live, and when it's in a given time and place proven too confusing for you to tackle directly. There's just, uh, I'm not going to test you on that. That's just my little advice there. And of course, in Socrates, we see precisely that the fruits of a good philosophy. He is completely at peace, even though he knows he's about to die. All right. Crito finally gets into the reason he came. He says, Oh, my beloved Socrates, let me entreat you once more to take my advice and escape. For if I die, I shall, if you die, I shall not only lose a friend who can never be replaced, but there is another evil. People who do not know you and me will believe that I might have saved you if I had been willing to give money, but that I did not care. Now can there be a worse disgrace than this, that I should be thought to value money more than the life of a friend? For the many will not be persuaded that I wanted you to escape and that you refused. So Crito's going for the jugular here, because he knows money is something Socrates is not fond of. So he's trying to say, look, people will think that I valued my money more than my letting my friend escape, because they'll think that I was too stingy to pay for your escape route. You can't let people think that. And then the next page, he brings up all sorts of other reasons. He, guilt, he brings up Socrates' children and the fact that he won't be able to educate them. And he says, look, it'll be easy to escape. It'll be cheap to, cheap, relatively cheap to escape. My reputation will be harmed if you don't escape. He's got all sorts of reasons. In other words, what's he doing? Sorry. Trying to convince them. And, it's, and if you're... If what you're saying is good and true, it's good to try and convince someone, but what's he, what's another word for what he's doing? He's not being successful because Socrates is the justice reasons. He's not going to want to escape the, the, the reasons as to why Athens took care that he should die. Yeah. It's an injustice for him to try to escape, so he's not going to do it anyways. But right, right. I mean, yeah, he, and he should, he should have known he wouldn't be able to convince Socrates, but maybe it was worth a try. I mean, it's... At the minimum, we can say, before we even analyze each of Crito's reasons, and I don't know if we will, the minimum, we can say he's got a lot of them. He's got a lot of reasons why Socrates should escape. And just per, speaking uh, from my own experience, maybe this will resonate with you, maybe not. But when I think back in my life, the worst decisions I've made, I've had the most reasons for. The best decisions I've made, I've had one really good reason for. Because the more, the more we multiply our reasons for doing something, the more likely we're just what? Rationalizing. The more likely we're rationalizing. And there's nothing wrong with having a lot of reasons to do something. Just be careful if you find yourself arbitrarily multiplying reasons for something. Because that's our subconscious psychological trick for rationalizing ourselves into doing something that we know we shouldn't do. Crito is, Socrates seems to not have that, uh, seems to not be victim to the temptations that ordinary people are. So Crito is fulfilling the role now of the rationalizing subconscious. Um, Socrates has one really good reason for not wanting to escape. As you all guessed and read, it would be an injustice. Why would it be an injustice, though? Well, that's going to require us to back up and look at some questions on this discussion sheet. This discussion sheet, more than other discussion sheets, isn't, isn't very closely attached to the dialogue itself, but it touches on questions that the dialogue touches on, which to get a really good answer to, we really need to zoom out a little more. Uh, but let me review, let me take a look at a couple other parts of the back and forth before we do that. Socrates says, but why, Crito, should we care about the opinion of the many? Good men, and they are the only persons who are worth considering, will think of these things as they truly happened. Indeed, it would be absurd to care about the opinion of the many if it contradicts the opinion of the good. Crito says, but we must regard the opinion of the many, because they're powerful. 
I paraphrase. He says, they can do the very greatest evil to anyone who has lost their good opinion. Socrates being quite ironic, obviously they can be quite powerful in a sense, but we don't need to go through all this again. Socrates is saying they have no power, actually. Everything they do is the result of chance, because the mob is just a bunch of tyrants, a bunch of, bunch of little individual tyrants who are governed by their lower desires, which are unpredictable. Therefore, everything they do is a result of chance, and they have no true power. But he's proven that well enough in the Gorgias dialogue. I don't suppose we need to go through all that again. Um, after Crito is done listing his tons of reasons why Socrates must escape, Socrates responds, Dear Crito, your zeal is invaluable, meaning it is precious if a right one. But if wrong, the greater the zeal, the greater the evil. That's strange. Zeal is a virtue. How could it be that the greater the zeal, the greater the evil? Well, virtue is a one-piece package. It only even counts as a virtue if it comes with all the other virtues. If it's a solitary virtue, scarcely counts as a virtue at all. Um, we all know that virtue must come with other, that any individual virtue must come with the other individual virtues to create a virtuous person. Um, I don't suppose anyone here would call a terrorist a good person. And yet there's no denying that they're quite what? Courageous, zealous. Courage and zeal are virtues. And yet they're not good people. They're not virtuous people. Why? Well, they lack wisdom and charity. Um, those, all, all the virtues must go hand in hand. Sure, there's a hierarchy of virtues, yes. But still, all the virtues have to go hand in hand. Or else, um, you could have a ton of one. No one would sit there and exhort a terrorist to courage. Even though courage is a good thing and it's a virtue, if you exhort a terrorist to courage, that is only, you just did a very bad thing. Because, uh, well, we all know why. But all the virtues must go together to generate a virtuous person is the point. Socrates says, now that this fortune has come upon me, I cannot put away the reasons that I have before given. The principles which I have hitherto honored and revered, I still honor. And unless we can find other and better principles on the instant, I am certain not to agree with you. No, not even if the power of the multitude could inflict many more imprisonments, confiscations, deaths, frightening us like children with hobgoblin terrors. Has the argument which was once good, now proved to be talk for the sake of talking, in fact an amusement only, altogether vanity? All right, before we go into the discussion sheet, that is a powerful few sentences Socrates has for us. I mean, I, I think about this a lot. If Socrates were to go, just submitting to Credo's argument right here, even though he knows it's not genuine, even though he knows he's not right, sure it would be easier. It would be really nice to escape. But what has he just done to all of the philosophizing he had been doing for decades? He just undercut all of it. He just might as well have just thrown it all out. It was all, if you're going to go back on your principles when the going gets tough, if you're going to go back on your principles when following them would be difficult, in other words, you've just proven that that was all just talk for the sake of talking. All of that, all those principles you voiced in your earlier days when voicing them was easy, you go contradicting them when it actually is difficult, you've just proven that was all val without any value. And Socrates realizes that. He realizes that if he were to escape contrary to his conscience, he will escape if what? Yeah, if Crito can genuinely, authentically convince Socrates that escaping is the right thing to do, that it's not an injustice, then yes, Socrates will gladly escape. He's willing to, he's very willing to be uh, refuted if he's wrong. He wants to, he wants to escape. He's not suicidal. He likes his life. Uh, he, just, sure, he's always saying, yeah, but I'm old, blah, blah, blah. But he likes his life. He would like to live. Um, he's not afraid of death either. But he will escape if he is genuinely in his conscience convicted that Crito is right. Aside from that, for him to escape, he would be contradicting everything he's ever stood for. And you can't do that. And this is a lesson, first of all, to remain true to your principles, but that's one lesson. What's the second lesson here? 
Be careful what you what? Be, be careful what principles you spout out, because you got to stick with them. Now again, I'm not saying you can't change your mind, but it's got to be an authentic change of mind. It can't just be, oh, I'm going to spout out these principles when it's easy to do so, knowing full well that I'm going to walk back on them when it's difficult to abide by them. And uh, boy, is that a lesson for us in the social media age, and everybody's always voicing every opinion on every little thing left and right. And uh, you know, if there's someone out there that doesn't like you and has some sort of a vendetta against you, they're right now storing everything you're doing on social media on their hard drive, waiting for you to contradict something you said so that they can call you out for it. I hate to say it, but that's the day we're living in. Oh, you're just hanging out today. Um, so really, really powerful lessons here, both of them. I mean, the more important lesson is stick with your principles. But the secondary lesson is also should be, re should be recalled. Be careful what you speak out loud. Because to be an authentic person, you must stick with that. This doesn't mean you can't change your mind if it's a legitimate change of mind. Okay, now I think we're just about ready to dive in a couple other small things here. Socrates helps Crito to see in the next page that what is good and true is never determined by a majority vote. Crito is fixated upon this notion that the many must be regarded, the many must be feared, the opinion of the many must determine what we do. Socrates points out that is obviously absurd, what is good and what is true has absolutely, uh, what the many believe has absolutely no bearing on what is good and true. Is this not true, Crito, of other things which we need not separately enumerate? In a matter of just and unjust, fair and foul, good and evil, which are the subjects of our present consultation, are we to follow the opinion of the many and to fear them, or the opinion of one man who is understanding, and whom we ought to fear and reverence more than all the rest of the world, and whom deserting we shall destroy and injure that principle in us, which may assume to be improved by justice and deteriorated by injustice? Is there not such a principle? Crito says, certainly there is, Socrates. Socrates is pointing out again, look, there's some principle, there's something in us that committing injustice deteriorates and acting justly improves. What is that something? Well, it's not the body, because clearly committing injustice is often good for the body and um, like saving your life, even if it requires an act of a bad act. And the converse, uh, committing justice is often not great for the body, committing injustice is often great for the body. So clearly there's something in us that justice improves. What is that something? Well, Socrates says it's the soul, Call it whatever you want, mind, psyche, spirit. It's not supposed to be controversial. It's just that there's something that is improved by justice. Whatever that something is, it is superior to the body, and the demands that it places upon us must be regarded as superior to bodily demands of, for example, extending life a few years longer. Do not say the many can kill us. The old argument is, as I conceive, as unshaken as ever. It is not life but a good life that is chiefly to be valued, Socrates says. It reminds me of the quote, all men live, all men die, not all men really live. So he, he sums this off. The other considerations which you mentioned, Crito, of money, loss of character, the duty of educating children, are, I fear, the doctrines of the multitudes. And there's certainly nothing wrong with educating your children. That's a very good thing. The point is, you can't say, oh, I need to commit this evil act to stay alive so I can do that. Poor Socrates is pointing out, no, that won't, that won't work. The only question which remains to be considered is whether we shall do rightly in escaping or letting others aid in our escape or paying them our thanks, so on and so forth. In other words, Socrates is saying, Escaping or cooperating with an escape. Those are morally identical actions. To do something, to do X, or to formally cooperate with X, whatever goes in X, those are morally identical actions. The distinction between formal and material cooperation is one I probably shouldn't try to dive into now for the sake of time, but maybe later. Um, the only question, again, is whether we do rightly in escaping or not. If the latter, if we do not do rightly, then death or any other calamity which may ensue on my remaining days must not even be allowed to enter into the calculation. Well, you might say, well, isn't that a little bit harsh, Socrates? Why not let it enter into the calculation? Well, because some for some calculations, that would be nothing but a distraction. 
Let me give you an example. If there's any math quizzes here, uh, listen closely because maybe you'll get the answer to this question. What is 5 times 3 times 8 times 10 times 0 times 8 times 4 times 11 times 12 times 3 times 2 divided by 4 times 8? Ooh, how's it 0? <laughs> there, was a, there was 1 times 0 in there. All it takes is 1 times 0 to render any product 0. And if I just kept on going with more mul multiplies and multiplication uh, and division questions in there, it would have just been a distraction. It wouldn't have changed anything because there was a time zero in there. And that overrides everything else no matter how many other reasons there were. That's what Socrates is saying. We mustn't even allow these other things to enter into the calculation. It would be a waste of time. It would distract us. And sure, Socrates has all the time in the world. He's just sitting there in a prison. But So wasting time is bad enough. But distracting you, willfully distracting yourself from what you already know is good and true and right, that's the bigger risk. Allowing yourself to risk distraction from what you already know is true. He's not, he can, Socrates can't let that happen. All right. But this all begs the question, why? Why is it unjust to escape? He doesn't... We need to really zoom out and look at law in general to try and answer that more uh, fully here. We have to zoom out so much, we need to take a look at what the very nature of law itself is. We, we need to uh, do a little bit of, a little mini political philosophy unit here. It's good for any intro philosophy course to at least touch on some of the biggest areas in philosophy. You know, we've done metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, um, logic. Let's take a look at some political philosophy now. Again, this will just be a tiny little intro to it, but helpful somewhat, I hope. And the most basic question in political theory, I suppose, political philosophy that one could ask, I suppose, would be what is the nature of law? What is its primary purpose? It's amazing how much we debate about what should be a law without ever pondering what the purpose of law is. Maybe that's why we come to so little agreement, because we haven't settled what its purpose is. Um, before bothering to answer the question, let's first answer why bother with the question. Because I have that right there in your sheet, right? Did I remember to add that? I, I made changes to the sheets. I just want to make sure it came through. Does it say why bother? Okay. Why bother with that question in the first place? Well, there's a philosophical axiom that goes as follows. Action follows me. that well, let me draw that out a bit as it pertains to our question no course of action can be properly determined Without first considering the nature, in other words, primary purpose in this case, the nature slash being of the thing in question. In other words, when you're trying to answer the question, what is a good blank? No matter what you put in that blank, in order to determine what a good blank is, you need to first know the nature of that thing you put in the blank. Before we can even debate about what a good law is, what laws are good and what laws are not good, we have to first at least settle on something as to the nature of law itself, the purpose of law itself. And I'm going to give you in a couple minutes the answer to have down for what the primary purpose of law is in ancient Greek thought. And I shouldn't have just said ancient Greek thought there, it's just traditional thought in general up until the modern era. Um, 
But first, let me just take a minute to run through what I hear most often given as the answer to this question through my years of, of teaching it. I, I often hear the, what is the primary purpose of law? Well, maybe the uh, preservation of order by way of deterrence. You know, law gives certain things you may not do, you must do, and other things you may not do, and presents a certain punishment if you contradict them. And the threat of that punishment serves as a deterrence to preserve order. But here's the thing. The primary purpose of a thing, here's more generally why we must ascertain it, but practically we ascertain the primary purpose of a thing because once that primary purpose is better achieved through something else, we do that something else instead. Primary purpose of fluorescent lights is what? Yeah, C, to generate light. Like, why, why do we use them instead of incandescence? Efficiency. Efficiency. So, the primary purpose of a fluorescent light is to generate light as efficiently as possible. That's its primary purpose. But what's the problem here? Not all that. <laughs> There's one problem. It would be even better if none of them were on because I hate fluorescent lights, which is good because now we have what? Natural is the best, but unfortunately we're starting to lose more and more natural light here as the sun goes down, so we have something better than fluorescence now, LEDs. Because the primary purpose of fluorescent lights was simply to generate light as efficiently as possible, and because LEDs now achieve that primary purpose better than fluorescence, we are going to what? Or we are already what? Yeah, we're getting rid of fluorescent Like, these will be gone soon. They're the only reason you still see any fluorescent lights is because of just remnant infrastructures, and they haven't gotten around to putting the money into replacing the infrastructure yet. Um, couple, within the past couple of years, Walmart made a big news announcement that they were going to change all of their lights in all of their stores around the world, change out their fluorescence with LEDs. It's gonna, they said it's going to save them something like $200 million a year in energy costs. Um, obviously, LEDs are superior to fluorescence in the primary purpose of the thing itself. Therefore, it's a no-brainer. We, we are going to abandon all fluorescence for the sake because LEDs do it better. They, do, they achieve the primary purpose better, and that's why everywhere you're seeing them being replaced. So we have to always settle what, what primary purposes exist for something we're doing and what secondary purposes there are. That's related to the consideration of means and ends also, but we'll get to that later. Um, the, all of these things I'm, I'm going through here, like preserving order by way of presenting a deterrent effect. That's certainly a purpose of law. But we have to be so careful before saying what the primary purpose of something is, because again, once that primary purpose is better achieved by something else, we go for that something else instead. So if the primary purpose of law is the preservation of order by way of deterrence, um, what might achieve that better than what any of us would call a good society? What would do that really well, much better than we do today? Exactly. Yeah, a completely fascist dictatorship maybe. Um, some works of fiction have done a great job guessing as the, what the future might look like under this. Anybody have any individual ones that come to mind? A lot of my students have read 1984. I haven't read that actually, but I've read Brave New World, which is my favorite dystopian novel. Um, none of us would want to live in a society where the primary purpose of law is said to be the preservation of order by way of deterrence. Because none of you know, that would be a military state, a police state, a, a, uh, it would not be good to live in. We, none of us would choose to live in that. Maybe, maybe that's what North Korea is like, I don't know. Um, so clearly that's an important purpose of law. But I don't think any of us would, should go so far as to say it's the primary purpose of law. And then we start going through the other reasons that are often given as the primary purpose of law, and we see that all of them also lead to some absurdities. Um, 
How about is the primary purpose of law simply to ensure the success of the nation, you know, measured primarily by GDP? That's how most people measure the success of a nation. Is that the primary purpose of law, the success of the nation? No. Because what would that, what kind of a situation would that render? But what would we want to do if that were the primary purpose of law? Yeah, bring back slavery. Great for the GDP, but terrible for. It's, but it's obviously wrong. But if pro, if the primary purpose of law is that, then that's what we should do. So clearly, that's not the primary purpose of law either. Um, how about making life? as easy as possible, as pain-free as possible, minimizing suffering as the, the, the minimization of suffering, this kind of utilitarian calculation as the primary purpose of law. What, what type of a society might that look like? I have another work of fiction in mind that did a great job envisioning what this would be. I had to read it in elementary school, actually. So it's, and a movie was made of it recently. Not kind of directed towards youth, I think, but I still like it. The yes, The Giver. Anyone else seen or read that? That did. A, I think that did an excellent job of showing what a society would be like that exalts the minimization of suffering to be the primary purpose of law, and no one would want to live in a society like that. Although it may be tempting at first, it's clearly wrong. There's all sorts of other reasons given throughout the history of political philosophy, and all of them are somewhat unsatisfying because they all lead to one, or one sort of absurdity or another. And this is going to sound really weird at first when I put this on the board, but just stick with me for a minute. I'm going to make more sense of it in the minutes moving forward. In ancient Greek thought, and in traditional thought in general up until the modern era, the primary purpose of law was simple. make men good. To make men good. All right. The first problem with this is obvious, and the ancient thinkers were not unaware of this problem. Goodness cannot be what? Cannot be made, cannot be forced. And, I mean, I'll put this, you don't need this down, but I should put it in the board because it's so obviously the case, but goodness cannot be forced. Now, they knew that. They knew that goodness cannot be forced. Nevertheless, they were as convicted as ever that the primary purpose of law still is to make men good. Because even if you can't force goodness, which you can't, you can do a few related things. First of all, how do you decide what to outlaw? You outlaw what is gravely contrary to goodness. The obvious things, at least. Murder, rape, theft, those things are so obviously and so blatantly and so gravely contrary to goodness that they simply must be outlawed. And you don't need all these details down, but, I'll put, but I want to put them on the board just to make more sense of this, I know, perplexing thing here. Outlaw what is gravely contrary to goodness. Permit, but discourage. At least never condone. What is somewhat contrary to goodness. and encourage and promote what is good, especially the common good. The 
common good is that good which is held in common by all. It doesn't mean you merely quantitatively add up the pleasures and pains of each person. That, that could lead to uh, the failure to respect the rights of the minority. No, the common good is something uh, higher than that. The common good are simply those good realities that are held in common by all people. The most o one of the most obvious, um, well, the most obvious dimension of the common good is human rights. That, that human beings have rights that must always be respected. That is the most obvious element of the common good. But another very tangible and obvious element of the common good is that physically, which is held in common by all. What is physically held in common by all? Air, water, natural beauty, nature in general, the goods that we receive. So, um, the, the, the uh, violation of this is called the tragedy of the commons. Has anyone ever heard of the tragedy of the commons? What happens there? It's just like when you have a shared resource and you overutilize it, the resource is Yeah, because each person using it, what? They're it, overusing it because they're not thinking about the yeah. use. Each person using it doesn't have sufficient motivation to treat it with respect because it's not individually his, it's just the commons. So what must the law do? The law must ensure that the commons are respected. And we're finally starting to realize that more today after a couple hundred years of forgetting it. Maybe that couple hundred years of forgetting it was largely because this, the primary purpose of law, was forgotten in the modern era. Anyway, the, the physical common good is only one portion of it, but it's certainly an important portion. No one denies. I, like, I don't think there's anyone who looks out in a beautiful landscape, breathes in fresh air, drinks clean water, and says, this is bad. Of course not. Everyone realizes that those are simply goods. And that's true in a more transcendent way than merely they contribute to physiological health as clean water and air do. That's true, yes, but they're good in a deeper way. These are things that we simply identify as good for no other reason than we just know they are. Beauty is one of those things that is good. The preservation of beauty, public beauty, what, how people decorate the inside of their homes is up to them, but the preservation of public beauty, yes, it's one of the elements of the primary purpose of law. Now, again, we know, they know that goodness cannot be forced, so there's a couple other criteria here. Let me put the same basic thing in different words. And again, you don't need all this down. But I want to try and make a little more sense of it, knowing how crazy it sounds at first. So you cannot force goodness, but you can do what? You can facilitate the good life. what philosophers call the good life, which is human flourishing. We'll talk more about that in the Aristotle unit. You want the purpose of law in this mindset is to generate a society in which becoming everything that a human being is supposed to be is made smooth, is made easy, is made natural. Facilitating the good life. I have another note down here. To create a society that is conducive to its members, becoming all that a human being ought to be. Discourage what is bad, encourage what is good, always in accordance with two things above all, the demands of human rights and the demands of human freedom. Because if you don't have those two constraints, you might start getting a little too particular and severe in trying to generate this goodness. The goodness, this goodness, this common good, may only be pursued in accordance with human rights and human freedom. And you know what, I'm gonna put that down. Still, you don't need this down either, but I am gonna put it down. In accordance with human rights, human 
free. While this discussion might seem tangential, it's actually necessary for us to answer why Socrates wouldn't escape from prison, but more importantly, perhaps, why we sometimes do have to break the law, and why it is not always an injustice to do so. But before moving on from this, at the minimum, even if one doesn't agree with that as the primary purpose of law, I think one lesson we can learn from their insights is at least that the law must never encourage what? That which is contrary to goodness. At the minimum, I hope we can all agree that that is not right, for the law to encourage what is contrary to goodness. And yet it does so all the time because it's seen as in the best interest of some secondary purpose of law, like the success of the state. Um, per prime example. The New, New York State runs something that is considered so not good that private entities aren't even allowed to do it. At least in the same way the New York State does it. The lotto. The lotto is run by New York State. The lotto is a tax on those who cannot do math. It is the opposite. So if most people, left and right wing people, have different views on how to achieve this, but most people, I think, believe that it would be better for us to have a more equitable distribution of wealth. Someone on the extreme left says, take it all from the rich and give it all to the poor. Someone on the right says, hands off, let the market figure it out. And there's all sorts of things in the middle. But at the minimum, it seems there's, that there's agreement that the gap between rich and the poor that we see today is ridiculous. Like, it's way too big, and it, it's something needs to happen. Um, what does the lotto do? Its very nature is to take that gap and increase it. It's to take a little bit of money from a lot of people and give it all to one person. <laughs> it's the opposite of what we're hoping to do in generating a better society. And yet, it is not only allowed by the state, it is actually specifically run by the state. And of course, they, they uh, as the saying goes, put lipstick on a pig by saying, oh, the proceeds are going to education. First of all, they're not. The education doesn't see those proceeds. And it just gets absorbed in, and no one can actually see what's being benefited by them. Secondly, who cares if it's benefiting a good thing? Its primary purpose is not good. Um, it is encouraging people to get deeper and deeper and deeper into these gambling addictions that are, and it's almost always poor people who are, who are addicted to the lotto, and New York State knows that, but they don't care because they get more and more money. And it's lining the coffers of certain people who benefit from it. And it's making one person really rich. And that one person who gets really rich, what usually happens to him or her? His, life is, his or her life is usually destroyed in like a matter of months because that much money is not good for anybody. And the only people who seem to really be able to handle it are those who've gradually grown used to it. Um, and it's, I'm not even saying it's good for them to be super rich. But anyway, I just th that's just one example of a million, but I just like to bring it up because it's a fairly obvious one. Um, it, it's, it's, it's one where this understanding of the nature of law is just blatantly contradicted. But why is it not changing? Well, because probably most people who run the government seem to think that the primary purpose of law is the success of the state, the financial success of those running the government, and it's very good for that. It funnels more money up into the hands of the government and out of the hands of the people. Uh, in so many ways, the exact same thing happens. You know, you think of um, tax breaks are one way the government encourages things. So, traditionally understood, what is good should be encouraged. Primary ways the government encourages things are funding and tax breaks. There's other ways, but those probably are the two most noteworthy. So theoretically, a tax break should only be given to promote something that is really good. Instead, tax breaks almost always happen to what? Individual states give tax breaks in hopes that what? Yeah, that they'll get 
the company to do business in their locality. So each state and locality is competing basically on their knees groveling before companies, trying to get them to move to their locality. And what's the end result of this? That corporations don't pay property taxes, which doesn't mean that the property taxes don't need to be paid, it just means that they're paid by whom? Yeah, homeowners, individual homeowners who have property tax bills that look more like rent payments for something that is a necessity and shouldn't be taxed at all, a basic dignified level of living. So we, we so invert, but, but again, maybe the reason we have such messed up laws is because we never talk about what its purpose is. Because action, as we said, follows being. Action follows being. We cannot know how to act if we do not consider the being of the thing in question. The question on the sheet is, can one ever morally break the law? And then there's a couple other questions after that, which we'll see are actually relevant. But that's, of course, the overarching question here. Socrates refuses to break the law. He does not see how, uh, he does not see anything in Crito's arguments that would indicate that doing so would be anything but an injustice. Um, but that doesn't mean that one can never only break the law. It's just that in this case, Socrates does not believe he could. Remember <clears throat> that Socrates is implying, if not outright stating, that there are times where one can morally break the law and must morally must break the law because he's saying I, that he wants to be persuaded by Crito. If there were no cases where you could break the law morally, then Socrates wouldn't have even engaged in this dialogue. I mean, he even says right here, right where we left off, right after, he says, I am extremely desirous to be persuaded by you, but not against my own better judgment. Socrates genuinely wants Crito to refute him. I mean, you, if he's right, if Crito's right, Socrates direly wants to be refuted because this would save his life. Um, but he's not going to just pretend that he's been convinced when he hasn't been. He's not just going to pretend that Crito has made a good argument when in fact Socrates can see that it was an erroneous one. Um, he says, I'm not against my own better judgment, in other words, not against my conscience. He goes back and forth with Crito for a bit to help him see that nothing ever justifies doing evil. If something is evil, it cannot be done, period. Then we ought not retaliate or render evil for evil, not to anyone, whatever evil we may have suffered from him. In other words, two wrongs don't make a right. We all learned it in kindergarten. I don't. Uh, I don't tolerate hearing from my three-year-old, but he did it first. So clearly, that doesn't work for adults either. But blank did some evil thing first. We all have known since kindergarten does not justify us doing something wrong in return. And yet, how easily we forget the most basic lessons, or how easily we rationalize them away. For this opinion, uh, here, here's actually a something you might not have expected Socrates to say. This opinion has never been held and never will be held by any considerable number of persons. And those who are agreed and those who are not agreed upon this point have no common ground and can only despise one another. Maybe Socrates is being a bit cynical here, but he's saying, look, most people don't really believe this, that you mustn't return evil for evil. Most people seem to think it's perfectly fine to return evil for evil. And he's furthermore saying that those who say that no, you must not return evil for evil, and those who say yes, you may return evil for evil, he's saying these people have nothing in common. They have no common ground, so they can't even dialogue, he's saying. He's probably thinking back to Calicles 20 years earlier, who clearly does uh, not hold this view that one may not, that two wrongs do not make a right. Um, so, I mean, Socrates was being a bit cynical here. He, uh, he, he seems to think that those who think that two wrongs do make a right, that it is good to get even, that vengeance is perfectly fine, uh, those who think that are just stuck thinking that forever. But even if many people act that way today, I think most people 
are willing to acknowledge that that is not correct. It is not okay to return wrong for wrong, evil for evil. The two wrongs do not make a right. Um, you know, Socrates didn't, I'll just throw this out there, Socrates obviously didn't know that 400 years later, what would later become the world's biggest religion specifically teaches that no, you cannot return evil for evil. That certainly helped more people to uh, side with Socrates in this question. But anyway, there we have it. Um, he goes in a long discourse, and I don't want to go through too many details of for the sake of time. He goes in a long discourse of the glory of the state. He personifies the laws. And it's an interesting personification. The laws come to him and say, Socrates, have we not been here for you all your life? Have we not given you everything from your very birth upwards? Have you not started a family under our care? Haven't you taken everything that is good from us? Now that something that is painful is coming from us, you, want, you would want to reject it by escaping prison? Do you want to destroy us, Socrates, us, the laws, the very ones who have given you everything? Well, that, of course, would be quite an injustice. Socrates says, continuing here, anyone who does not like us in the city and who wants to go to a colony or any other city may go where he likes and take his goods with him. But he who has experience of the manner in which we order justice and administer the state and still remains has entered into an implicit contract. A couple points here. Um, more generally, the important point is that commitment, any commitment, requires being willing to accept not only that which is pleasant, but that which is unpleasant. And certainly the case with citizenship. We, as a citizen of a city, state, a country, whatever, you accept all sorts of good things from the hands of the law. And therefore, when the law has something not so pleasant, for you, you must accept that as well. Commitment always implies being there in good times and in bad, in other words, which conjures up what in one's mind? Another major commitment where those words are often spoken, marriage, the ultimate commitment. Um, but that's true with all sorts with other commitments as well. It's uh, quite duplicitous of someone to passively accept all the good things from the object of the commitment, but then somehow not be there to accept the not-so-good things. Um, so that's the case with the laws as well, Socrates is saying. But we would be going a step too far to say that Socrates is teaching social contract theory here, because he's not in the modern sense of the word. In the modern sense of the word, social contract theory, as Thomas Hobbes put it, that is the only purpose of any society, of any law, of any state, of any organization, of any religion, of any um, community whatsoever. For Thomas Hobbes and his social contract theory, it's all just kind of this agreement. The only purpose of all that stuff is just because we kind of need to enter into some sort of agreement to stop killing each other. Uh, Aristotle, on the other hand, says, no, man is a political, an a social animal by nature. We need other people. That's, who, that's how we operate, that's who we are. And I think Aristotle's right, and Socrates is not going as far as Hobbes here, saying that the, whole, the only real meaning of all this stuff is that it's a contract. No, he's just saying that's part of it. And of course it's part of it. We enter into an implicit contract by accepting what is good from any commitment, certainly the case of the state and law. Um, a duplicitous person uh, perhaps a, a bad friend is often revealed precisely by their unwillingness to be there in a commitment for what is unpleasant as willingly as he was there for what was pleasant. Socrates again realizes that when you make bold claims about something you better stand by them even when it hurts you. He continues on here and gives another reason he will not escape. The laws are still speaking, he's still personifying the laws speaking to him as if he were about to escape, saying, you yourself, if you fly to one of the neighboring cities, as for example to Thebes or Megara, both of which are well-governed cities, you will come to them as an enemy, Socrates, and their government will be against you, and all patriotic citizens will cast an evil eye upon you as a subverter of the laws, and you will confirm in the minds of the judges the justice of their own condemnation of you. For he who is a corrupter of the laws 
is more than likely to be a corrupter of the young. Well, what does that have to do with? You might say, well, that's unfair. What does being a corrupter of the laws have to be have to do with being a corrupter of the youth? Absolutely, that's certainly true. There's a direct connection in that sense that he would be setting an example that they would follow. But I think it's also the case that even looking back, the judge, he has this interesting point that the judges would, would feel assured that they did the right thing in condemning Socrates. Because clearly he just escaped prison, so he's clearly a corrupter of the laws. He must also have been a corrupter of the youth. So I think it's even retrospective. And um, it's interesting because he's on to something here. Like, uh, my, my cousin was recently serving on a jury and he shared with me what the, the jury, he and the rest of the jury voted this guy guilty. And the, the prosecutor wasn't allowed to say all these other things during the case, so he didn't. But after the, con after the verdict was rendered, the prosecutor came in just to reassure the jury and said, by the way, guys, I wasn't allowed to say this during the trial, but this guy also did this and this and this and this and this. And you really can sleep soundly knowing that you did the right thing, voting him guilty. Um, he just wanted to do that to ease their consciences, to, to help them know, feel more assured they did the right thing, that they concluded correctly, and I'm sure they did. Um, my cousin's a good guy. But uh, why would he bother with that? Well, because we know that these things are infectious. We know that injustice is not so easily containable. It's not so easily compartmentable in one little spot in your life. It's like any contagion. It spreads rapidly. It doesn't know where to stop. That's the nature of injustice. So, you know, it's like a door. You know, you could say, you could say, okay, I'm going to be a corrupter of laws, but I'm not going to be a corrupter of youth. I'm not going to be impious. I'm not going to be all these other unjust things. It's like saying, okay, this door here is only this much open. So no one, no one can fit through this door as it is. So if I really don't want anyone else to come into the class, am I say, just leave the door like that? No one can fit through it. Of course, I, yeah, they can't fit through it right now, but so what? It's so easy to push an ajar door open further. If you really don't want someone to come in, you've got to firmly shut the thing so that it latches and hopefully lock it also. It's the same way with injustice. You can't, there's no way, we, you know, we always pretend that we have some reason that we'll be able to stop it short at some point before it dominates our lives, but that's never how it winds up being. It always spreads. It's just a matter of time. Socrates realizes that, and he realizes that the judges realize that. So he's, what he's saying here is very interesting. He's saying, if I were to prove myself a corrupter of youth, the judges, thinking back to what they did, would think they did the right thing by condemning me as a corrupter of youth, knowing now that I'm also a corrupter of laws, if I were to escape. Very interesting. And prosecutors know that. That's why they do what I just said they did uh, to my cousin a few months ago. That's why they reassure people with things they weren't allowed to say because they weren't admissible in court during the trial. Because we all know that that's how injustice works. It spreads and it spreads and it spreads in someone's life. I have a little note here. I guess I'll say it. Uh, you know, it's funny how many people will uh, have a few friends that they'll just readily gossip with about other friends. What do you think those friends are doing when you're not there? They're gossiping about you. <laughs> Someone who's willing to gossip is willing to gossip. It's not containable. Uh, it's just like any injustice. It spreads. It crashes right through the pathetic little barriers we thought we constructed against it. All right. If you go away from well-governed states to Crito's friends in Thessaly, apparently Thessaly had all sorts of disorder, where there is great disorder and license, they will be charmed to have the tale of your escape from prison. But there will be no one to remind you that in your old age you violated the most sacred laws from a miserable desire for a little more life. Wow. So he's saying, sure, you could get away from the people who will call you out for your injustice, but that would be even more pathetic spend the rest of your days with no one to remind you of what you've become. And that would be much worse than just being called out for something. So he's got a few more things to say, but before we go over those, let's get back to our discussion sheet here. Because this is what we all want to know. Can one ever morally break the law 
Well, the answer, you already all know the answer. The answer is obviously yes, but we need to philosophize a little more about that. It's important that we do that here because there's not much about that in the dialogue. And it harkens back to the answer to the first question in this discussion sheet. So the primary purpose of fluorescent lights are to generate light as efficiently as possible. The primary purpose of law is to make men good. We abandon fluorescent lights in a certain situation. What then is the analogous situation in which we abandon obeying a given law? That might have been a way too convoluted question to make any sense as I phrased it. <laughs> so when the, here's the moral, long story short, when the primary purpose of a thing is subverted, we always abandon it and go for something else that achieves that primary purpose better. So if the primary purpose of law is to make men good, then it would obviously be absurd to obey a given law if it makes you bad. This sounds too obvious we were saying, but it must be said. In other words, if obey, well, let me just put this real clearly for the sake of All right, first of all, the general norm. A course of action must be abandoned. Whenever its continuation would contradict the primary purpose of that at which it aims. The course of action must be abandoned whenever its continuation would contradict the primary purpose of that at which it aims. All right, so the course of action of continuing to use fluorescent lights must be abandoned whenever its continuation. Continuing to use fluorescent lights would contradict the primary purpose, which is to generate light as efficiently as possible. That's what it aims at. And continuing to use fluorescent lights contradicts that, because now LEDs do it better. Now this, in turn, is a subordinate good, at least from a corporate standpoint. This is a subordinate good, in the case of fluorescent lights, to profitability in general, which is why not all fluorescent lights have been replaced yet, because they're weighing that particular efficiency against, their, against the costs of replacing the infrastructure. More on subordinate goods and ultimate goods in Aristotle, but this will suffice for now. Clearly, if obeying the law is directed at making, men, making you good, because that's what the law itself is directed at, then one must not continue to obey the law in a given case if doing so would contradict the primary purpose of its aim, which is goodness. Pretty straightforward. In other words, if obeying a given law would itself be an injustice. then the primary purpose of law in that case has been subverted. Now here's the thing. There's both a subjective and an objective dimension to injustice. One must regard both very highly. The subject of dimension has a lot to do with one's conscience. In fact, that's the only way one can really ultimately know whether he's doing right or wrong. It's by virtue of his conscience, which, yes, the conscience, that voice that we talked about in the Apology, that tells us when something's wrong, that conscience should be formed in accordance with objective principles. 
you know, moral ethics, moral philosophy, learning right from wrong, what we hopefully all do when we grow up. That's, that's, what we, that's how we form our conscience. In other words, that's how we train that inner voice to be able to tell us when something's right and when something's wrong. But ultimately, in the heat of the moment, it's still that inner voice that tells us what's right or what's wrong. That's the subject of dimension of it. So in the object of dimension of this, we form it properly in accordance with truth and goodness. But in the subject of dimension, the voice of the conscience still must always be obeyed. And no one can tell you what your conscience is telling you except you. Only you know what your conscience is telling you. You can lie to yourself, which wouldn't be very wise. But still you know. You know what it's telling you. So, since you know what is an injustice by virtue of your conscience, in other words, if your conscience demands that you break the law, then you must do so. And I'm not going to have, I don't want to put any more on the board, I already have too much on, so you don't have to have all that down. I'm just expounding upon this point. If obeying a given law would itself constitute an injustice, then in that case, the primary purpose of law has been subverted. And when the primary purpose of a thing is subverted, you no longer continue with it. But you don't even know when that's happened unless you first settle what the primary purpose of a thing is. The primary purpose of law is simply to increase the GDP and contribute to the success of your country, then you better obey the law even when it tells you to do something horrible. Because the whole purpose of law is not about goodness, but it's about money. But of course that's wrong. That's not the primary purpose of law. And this is why totalitarian regimes who do think that the success of their nation is supreme are constantly uh, committing injustice, constantly requiring their citizens to do horrible things and mistreating their citizens. The quintessential example is, um, you know, the Nazis tell you that you must turn in your Jewish neighbors. Well, that would itself be an injustice. So it doesn't matter if the law is telling you to do that. It would be wrong in and of itself. So you must disobey. That's one example of many, of course. But it's certainly a valid example. I don't think anyone would argue with that. To put it briefer still, I'm debating whether to put this in the board. I don't want to give you guys too much. Um, I'll just say this out loud because I think this is this will maybe stick with you. If obeying a law makes you bad, then that law cannot make you good. So the purpose of law is to make men good, but if obeying a given law makes you bad, then its purpose cannot be fulfilled. I don't suppose the law too often does that, thankfully. It depends on the times. Sometimes it does it more often than others. And the law actually requires you to do something bad. If the, if the, if obeying a given law makes you bad, then that law cannot make you good. So, I know it's we it sounds weird, but it's kind of a simplistic, I suppose, way of putting it. Now, this again is only valid if indeed the purpose of law is to make men good, but I propose that is the valid primary purpose of law. And that's precisely why we must reject any law that obeying would make us bad. Now, because there is indeed a subjective dimension to this, other different people can legitimately follow this norm different ways. Some people, for example, are so opposed to something that the government is doing that they won't even what? Pay taxes. Because paying taxes does what? It, it materially, and here I should run through this real quick. Okay, I'm not going to test you guys in this, but it would be ridiculous for me to not say something about it. Don't worry about having this down. Um, it's probably pretty safe to say that the government, the, the U.S. government, the federal government, is doing something that you morally abhor. Whether you're extreme left wing, extreme right wing, or anywhere in between, that's probably the case, just considering how many things the federal government is doing. So, by paying taxes, you are cooperating, meaning you are somewhat involved with that act that you morally abhor. But, you're still morally safe paying taxes, in my opinion, my humble opinion, 
Why? Because it is not formal cooperation, it is material cooperation. With material cooperation, you are simply involved with something against your will. You do not intend to explicitly endorse it. You are not in deliberately condoning it. You're just some, in some way, shape, or form involved. Paying taxes, of course, you're involved in whatever the government's doing by paying taxes to that government. It's good to avoid material cooperation with something that is wrong whenever we can, but it's not always reasonably possible. Because we can't all do tax protests and spend the rest of our life in jail. Uh, on the other hand, formal cooperation with an injustice is itself always an injustice. In other words, to specifically condone something, to encourage someone to do it, to praise someone to, for doing it, to thank someone for doing it, to donate something. You know, paying taxes does not specifically fund any one thing. But if you specifically give money to a given cause for a given reason, that's formal cooperation. Um, there's all sorts of formal cooperation. And that must never be done no matter what with an injustice, because formal cooperation with injustice is itself always injustice. All right. Just wanted to throw that out there. So let's get to the next part of this question, though. Some of you probably already have the answer to this swimming around in your head. Maybe you see how it's relevant, maybe not. But what document contains the supreme law of our land? The Constitution, of course. How does this shed light on this question? Well, first of all, the Constitution. I think we all know that. How does this shed light on the question we're considering now? Well, the Constitution itself Although it is the supreme law of our land, quite obviously, nevertheless acknowledges, implicitly at least, that it is not absolutely supreme. How? Okay, that's, yeah, so first of all, delineates um, different branches of government for checks and balances. That's a good point. How else does it acknowledge that it is not, that although it is the supreme civil law of our land, it is nevertheless not absolutely supreme. Just because of the amendments? Exactly. It acknowledges its own mutability. Now, hearkening back to a philosophical axiom, um, perfection presupposes immutability. And you don't need that down. But the, for a thing to be perfect and supreme necessarily means that it cannot change. Uh, the Pythagorean theorem is perfect in predicting the hypotenuse of a right triangle based upon the leg length of a right triangle. Therefore, it is not open for change. No one dares change the Pythagorean theorem because of it. we all know that would be absurd. It's already perfect. So, by the Constitution, in its very own wording, saying, look, please change this if that is demanded, if that is called for, the mere fact that it acknowledges that that may be called, might be called for acknowledges that it is not supreme. But if it's not supreme, and if there might be a situation that arises where it should be changed, then the whole point of changing one thing is to better correlate it to that which is more perfect and supreme above itself. In the case of this supreme law of our civil law of our land, the Constitution, what is that mysterious something? which the Constitution itself could at least theoretically be better conformed to, to look like. Because there's no, at least not when the Constitution was, was written, there was no international thing superior to it. And there still isn't, we have sovereignty still. It is not written on pages anywhere. Civil law, there's a quote, and I can't remember it exactly, but it's well put. A student shared it with me recently, actually. That civil law is a creation of man, and man cannot ever be mastered by his creation. The civil law, even the supreme civil law of our land, is an attempt, sometimes a successful one, sometimes an unsuccessful one, to correlate to the transcendent moral law itself. By the Constitution acknowledging that it can and should be changed, it is implicitly saying that this should incur if we ever come to realize 
that what is superior to the Constitution, namely the moral law itself, actually demands something else, actually demands that the Constitution say something other than what it says. Maybe something less than what it says, maybe something more than what it says. Most famously, we did that with the 14th Amendment, which says what? Hope I have my amendments right. That was slavery, right? 14th? Do I have that right? Because we realized that the Constitution failed to outlaw something that the moral law does outlaw. And it doesn't matter how many people agree or disagree. If 99% of the population wakes up tomorrow morning and decides, you know what, I want slavery back. It doesn't matter because it's contrary to the moral law itself. And even if they succeeded in eliminating the 14th Amendment, that wouldn't make it right. It would just make it legal. Everything Hitler did was legal because he made it legal. And that, of course, answers the last question in the sheet as well. But uh, I suppose we'll save that more on that until we get to it in a couple minutes here. So how can I put that all in a nutshell? All right, the Constitution acknowledges its mutability. That's, well, I'll put changeability. The Constitution acknowledges its changeability. thus recognizing that a superior law exists. To which it may be better conformed. So there's this thing called the moral law. It is not written on a piece of paper anywhere because we all simply know it interiorly. And if that something called the moral law contradicts something that even the supreme law of the land says is okay, well, whenever two principles contradict, you, of course, always go for the superior and reject the inferior. Civil law is always, by its very nature, inferior to the moral law. So if the moral law, which you know, yes, by objective principles, but also by the subjective voice of your conscience, if the moral law demands a certain course of action, then that course of action must be followed even if it contradicts the highest civil laws. And that's pretty straightforward. But I think, I, I hope that puts it shortly enough. Although maybe I'll just add a couple words to that. I think maybe there's a little more space in your sheets. All right, acknowledging its changeability, that's recognized in the superior law. So I'll also add to that this moral law. Hopefully, the this is is uh, fairly clear to what it re what it refers to, namely this superior law. This moral law must be followed whenever the civil law contradicts it. But here's the thing. This probably doesn't justify as many things as some people wishes could be justified. The moral law does not demand that you uh, get high on your recreational drug of choice. <laughs> it, uh, that's not a valid exception to the demands of the civil law, nor are many other things that perhaps we'll go over. But that at least is an exception. That's certainly an exception. I don't think many people would contradict that. Some would. There's other ways of phrasing this general norm. Martin Luther King was fond of quoting St. Augustine on this, who said basically the same thing, but he said it with other words. And he said that an unjust, he said basically one must always be lawful, law-abiding, but an unjust law 
is not a law at all. It may be written on the law books, but it's not actually a law. It doesn't count as a true law. And that's another way of saying basically the same point. So it's a, a different way of wording, really. Substantially the same teaching, I'd say. All right. Now, this doesn't, I'm not saying this is the only exception. It certainly is an exception. This certainly is a case where you must break the civil law. But um, what about some other possibilities? This might be the only possibility that Socrates would admit, but I think there's more legit exceptions. I'm going to watch a video clip, maybe next class, a brief one, that uh, illustrates a valid exception. It's the one that most people will think of. Stealing so you can what? Eat, survive, feed your family. And that's certainly a valid exception because you have a moral duty to provide for the needs of yourself and those who depend upon you, mainly your children. Uh, that's certainly a demand of the moral law. And it doesn't mean that you can do something, it doesn't mean you can kill somebody else to, uh, to satisfy that duty. But it does mean, but stealing is generally considered something that you certainly could do because although it's contrary to the civil law, it's not intrinsically unjust. Something that's intrinsically unjust is absolutely never okay. I'm going on a tangent here, you don't need this down, but uh, directly and intentionally murdering an innocent human being, in intrinsically unjust. Cheating on your spouse, intrinsically unjust. Uh, most moral philosophers would say, and I agree, lying, intrinsically unjust. But stealing is not considered, not generally considered to be one of those things. Um, and that might sound strange, but it's, re it's really not. It's wrong to be avoided, but it's not intrinsically unjust because of something called the universal destination of goods. We own our property, yes, contrary to uh, Marxism, which would say you don't own your property. No, I believe you do own your property, but you do not have an absolute right to your property uh, because all property ultimately has a universal destination. So if you're dying of thirst and somebody owns a well, that person has absolutely no moral right to deny you water. That's a basic tenet of the moral law. And if taking that water, if, if staying alive required drinking that water, sneaking in at night when the owner didn't see you and breaking the civil law at the same time, you'd be perfectly morally justified in doing that. Um, but you know, you gotta be really careful with the application of that principle. There's a news story locally recently, maybe in the last year or two, somebody was caught stealing diapers and it was a big sob story and um, you know, diapers are not necessary. Like disposable diapers are a modern invention for the vast majority of human history. They didn't exist, and somehow we got by just fine. As one, as a parent who has changed many a cloth diaper, I can attest to the fact that there's nothing wrong with just wrapping a towel around a kid's butt. It's a little bit uglier than being able to just throw away a disposable diaper. Yes, but it works fine. Anyway, my point is, you got to be careful in determining what's actually necessary before you go breaking the law saying it's necessary. Um, it's really gotta be necessary. So there's other cases as well. There's one, there's usually, there's at least one more exception, maybe two more that always come up that we should cover because we would we'd be leaving out important things that we didn't. It was, became a big thing in the 20th century especially, especially in India. Man in India really started this. I don't know if he started it, but he popularized it at least. A great man. Gandhi. What, what, what's that? Yeah, okay, hunger strike, that, that's intense. That was one of those things he did. But also civil disobedience. You know, the very name, you are disobeying a law by definition, the civil disobedience. And this is a, a more gray area. Socrates would probably say, no, that's not okay. Maybe I'm wrong. I can only guess what Socrates would say about that. But I think it can be okay if it's careful. I think Gandhi was justified in using it. The most famous example in America, at least the first 
time that really became big in America. What's that? Yeah, exactly. Rosa Parks. So it's a good example because there's nothing immoral about sitting in this seat in the bus instead of this seat. So it's not like she could justify breaking the law by any of the criteria we've laid out so far. But she did the right thing, I'd say, because a whole system of laws had become so corrupt and so unjust that additional measures were necessary. But it must always be peaceful, it must always be careful, and it must always be very well thought out. Usually when people claim they're being civilly disobedient, they're really just rioting, which doesn't help anyone. Um, but anyway, I think that can constitute a valid exception to obeying the law. But again, be very careful with that. Um, here's another one. We probably all broke the law today because we probably all... You can admit it. I won't turn you in. Sped. There's one that always comes up. Now, here's the thing. Let me ease your conscience a little bit. Although maybe also prick it a little bit. I don't know. We'll see. Um, unless all of the elements of the definition of a thing exist, that thing itself does not exist. I didn't go through the definition of law. I just went through the primary purpose of it with you. The definition of a law includes that it is promulgated. A law is an ordinance of reason, meaning not unjust, enacted by the legitimate authority. In other words, I can't just write down a law and claim it's a new like, constitutional amendment or something. I, I, I don't have the power to do that. And promulgated. Those are the three elements of the definition of any law. In other words, if it's not promulgated, it's not what? A law. Philosophically speaking. Civilly speaking, it is. Civilly speaking, a law is a law even if it has no promulgation. Uh, the promulgation of something is it's being spread, announced, and enforced. Okay, so where am I going with this? If a law is not promulgated, then it's not actually a law. But if something is not at all enforced, then it's also not promulgated, which means it's not a law. So how is that related to speeding? It's only enforced at a certain point. And this varies by state, so you got to know what you're up against. But in New York, we all know full well that if you're going within five miles an hour of the speed limit in a local road, 10 miles an hour on a highway, you are absolutely not going to get pulled over for that. We all just know that. Uh, you would, if you're going 34 and a 30, you probably wouldn't even slow down if a police officer is right next to you. I know I wouldn't, because I know that he's not going to pull me over for going 34 and a 30. Um, in other words, it's only enforced above a certain level. Sure, there's a number on a sign, and sure, the book said the law in the book says I give a number, but de facto, what's actually enforced and promulgated is above a certain level. And that can't be written down, obviously, but I think we always kind of know that's the case. And some hardcore law-abiding people would refute me, I would argue against me on that. But I'm, I feel pretty morally safe speeding within reasonable limits. But here's a good test. If you find yourself adopting radically different driving habits when there's a cop around and when there's not, you probably should reevaluate your driving habits because you probably are disrespecting the law to a degree that's not justifiable. Um, and look, if you just generally obey the uh, traffic law, it's so much more enjoyable to drive. You're not always looking over your shoulder. You're not always freaking out, wondering if a cop saw you do that. It's just so much more peaceful. I, I highly recommend driving well. I drive like a grandma and I'm proud of it. It also saves gas. Um, anyway. There's other exceptions probably, but at the same time, the exceptions are probably a little more rare than some people would like them to be when we must obey the law. Certainly, you know, petty little things like, oh, I, I enjoy abusing this drug. I think it's stupid that it's outlawed. Therefore, I'm going to do this drug. I, I, I really want a little more money, so I'm going to cheat on my taxes. Oh, this, this uh, corporation really could spare some extra money, so I'm going to steal little things from the store there. I, I've had students in their papers try to justify all of those things to me. And uh, sorry, that, those things do not constitute valid exceptions to the obedience we must give to the law. Anyway, let's polish off this sheet before any more time goes up here. There's at least one more question here. 
But first, I think I will just end the, read the last little paragraph of the dialogue itself here. Socrates ends his discourse personifying the laws with the following paragraph. Listen then, Socrates, to us who have brought you up. Think not of life and children first and justice afterwards, but of justice first, that you may be justified before the princes of the world below. For neither will you nor any that belong to you be happier or holier or juster in this life or happier in another if you do as Crito bids. Now you depart in innocence, a sufferer, not a doer of evil, a victim not of the laws but of men. Remember, Socrates is not blaming the law in general. He's not ranting against the man. He's not lamenting the system. He just realizes that there are some individual unjust men who applied the law very poorly in his case. Okay, I continue here. But if you go forth, returning evil for evil, injury for injury, breaking the covenants and agreements which you have made with us, and wronging those whom you ought least to wrong, that is to say, yourself, your friends, your country, and us, then we shall be angry with you while you live. And our brethren, the laws in the world below, will receive you as an enemy. For they will know that you have done your best to destroy us. Listen then to us, and not to Crito. Socrates ends the, that's the end of his discourse, personifying the laws. And he reminds Crito, this is the voice I seem to hear murmuring in my ears, like the sound of a flute in the ears of a mystic. And he asks Crito if he has anything else to say. Crito says, I have nothing to say, Socrates, in his last line there. Then let me follow the intimations of the will of God. Intimation. What is an intimation of something? An intimation of something is just like a hint or a clue. You can be rather convicted based on an intimation, but you're not pretending to have mathematical certainty of something. In other words, Socrates is not pretending that, that God himself dropped a piece of paper down saying, this is what you must do. But so what? That never happens. That almost never happens. We are given intimations, and if we refuse to follow our intimations, then what becomes of us? What else are we going to follow but the intimations we get of what we ought to do? Socrates is going to follow those intimations. It's not going to rationalize them away. All right, very last question here. This is uh, another one that has an obvious answer, but we should philosophize a little more about it here. The answer to this last question is obviously... Oh, there's agreement here. No, of course the answer is no. It is not sufficient. But why is it not sufficient? Well, we, if, first of all, maybe you'd say it's not sufficient because you disagree with the ancient Greek thought and the primary purpose of law, and that's, that would be one reason it's not sufficient. But even if, even if the ancient Greek thought and the primary purpose of law is correct, it does not follow that obeying the law is sufficient to render one a good person. And there are at least three separate very important reasons for this. Even if it is true that the primary purpose of law is to make men good, and I think it is, it does not follow that individual laws are actually crafted in accordance with the nature of law. Whenever we're dealing with human beings, we're dealing with free will. And those who have free will can choose, unfortunately, to contradict the nature of things and how they use them. Just like someone who chops off his fingers for the fun of it contradicts the nature of his hand, and one who chooses to lie contradicts the nature of communication. The human beings can contradict the nature of things. Although the primary purpose of law is goodness, this does not mean individual laws will be crafted in accordance with that purpose. It's 
So there's one reason. Okay, let's say that we have a set of laws that actually is crafted very well in accordance with the purpose of law. And we have a set of laws that is oriented towards making people good. Even then, it would not make one a good person because obeying the law, except, of course, in the cases we, the exceptions we discussed, obeying the law is necessary, not sufficient for goodness. For an individual's goodness. Last but not least, this is related to point two, but it's important enough to, have, to be listed on its own. Laws usually deal with what? Well, what are laws usually dealing with? Are you, do laws usually tell you what you what to do or what not to do? No. Yeah, they usually tell you what not to do. Laws usually deal with what is. Not, well, let me put it differently. Laws usually deal with what not to do. The goodness of a person, goodness, individual goodness, goodness flows primarily not from what one avoids, but what, from what one does. Yes, it's important to avoid certain things, but that is not the primary wellspring of one's goodness. Laws usually deal with what one is to not do. Goodness comes primarily from what one does do. There we have it.